to what is the annual Sibsi FM group and ASHRAE group event. Uh, Tim, the current chair of the ASHRAE group, we were talking earlier. Um, we're not sure if it's 16 or 17 years that we've been doing this jointly. Uh, one of the big things, apart from obviously within Sibsi, BIFM, all the other, Bizria, we often try and do uh, not only the networking, but work jointly and collaboratively to try and get opinions, discussions and put on interesting events. Uh, what I always say about our group is we always have great speakers, great venues, good subjects and good refreshments. And I think thanks to UBM and Canfield, we're going to do all of that tonight. So I chair the Sibsi FM group. We have these regular events. It's so great to see uh, many of the usual faces and some new friends here tonight. Um, I'm going to hand you over to Simon Burkett just shortly. Hope you enjoy the presentation. We'll be an interactive discussion afterwards, after Simon and Canfield's presentations and then we'll carry on drinking, discussion, and networking afterward. So, thank you very much indeed. Uh, there are the details just up there. Uh, people say, I'd love to be a member of the FM group. I'd love to get more involved. So there's the Twitter details, and uh, just email all Sibsi groups and just say you want to be a member of the FM group or the ASHRAE group. And uh, we'd love to see you at future events. Thank you. Jeff, thank you very much. I can see that people are really quite shy, so um, <laughs> uh, I will try to speak up so you can hear me. Um, I'm uh, very pleased to be here this evening. Um, my name is Simon Burkett. Uh, my Twitter handle is Clean Air London, and I set up Clean Air London 11 years ago, and we have one mission, which is to uh, achieve full compliance with World Health Organization guidelines for air quality throughout London and, and elsewhere. Uh, so what I'd like to do tonight is just give you a bit of an overview about outdoor air pollution and why indoor air quality I think is extremely important. It is the best opportunity to um, protect people quickest. Uh, and I'm very pleased that Chris Ecob is speaking after me because he's one of my favorite speakers. And I think one of his final slides uh, has got the answer to a question which I asked him at the first thing I saw him this evening. So uh, Clean Air London, when I got set up, um, it's a very political campaign that I run, uh, but it is non-party. I've been very rude about all the political parties uh, over the years, including accused, accused Boris of public health fraud on an industrial scale, accused the Labour government of one of the biggest public health cover-ups or failings in modern history, which I took a bit of courage to do. Uh, so I've done things like that, but uh, I've, got, uh, I've certainly had fun doing it, but that's the mission. Uh, and this is really the strategy. So I've focused for 11 years every single day on London and up. So I uh, now chair the Knightsbridge Neighbourhood Forum. Uh, we're writing planning policies for Knightsbridge, which I hope will be copied by many other people. Um, I run Clean Air in London, and I also sit on a UN steering group for their five-year report on the global environment. Uh, so the, the vision really here is that you know, climate targets in 2020, 2050, to me, are like generals behind the front lines in the First World War, sort of drawing sweeping lines to invade France or Germany. Uh, really, the battle is being fought in that top left corner where air, air quality laws are being breached by a factor of two or three times. Uh, and in uh, Brixton Road, by the 5th of January this year, we've breached the legal limit for a whole year. But if we can actually mobilize political leadership, technology, and behavioral change, I think we can crack that top left box, uh, and crack all of these other problems as well. Uh, these are just some of the principles. I won't dwell on them. I've got quite a few slides, but this is uh, something that you can have a look at later if you like. But this is really trying to just uh, point out to people that uh, transport measures are uh, about emissions and also congestion. Um, uh, this is really uh, just encouraging people to think about one version of the atmosphere. So don't think just about carbon dioxide, which is why we've got the de dreadful diesel problem. We need to think about air as one problem, not as uh, um, uh, just a climate problem or something else. Um, the reason I got into air quality was a bit by accident. Uh, I was campaigning on rat running in local streets. Uh, but what I found out is how bad the air pollution problem is in London but also there are powerful laws in place to get something done about it. So whereas before we, we won in the High Court and achieved absolutely nothing, uh, on air quality, on the 5th of uh, January every year, I have to do is put up my um, hand and say we've reached the legal limit for a year, and you get the media out in uh, droves 
Uh, and these are some of the media channels that have covered what I've been doing over the last 10 years. Um, I found it's much easier to get the public to understand uh, what the problem is. Um, greatly helped by the Evening Standard covering the story just about every single day now. Um, the Sunday Times covers it most weekends uh, and of course many other papers as well. Uh, but the people who have been hardest to actually get to understand this have actually been the politicians. Um, they really just do not want to um, uh, grapple with the, the issues that um, uh, these health issues raise. Milestones and successes. Uh, the first few years um, I was um, lobbying in Europe to get the air quality directive in place. The Olympics was another big um, uh, success um, and we went from the start of that year with only three of us really campaigning on air quality to about 20 by the end of the year. Uh, and very much helped by Camphill. Um, Camphill are the um, lead sponsor for Cleaner in London and have, and have supported us for six years. Um, I don't get paid anything for, for running the campaign, but they have been fabulous supporters. Um, and uh, the focus really at the moment um, is um, uh, obviously what happens with Brexit. There are um, strong laws in place, which I've mentioned, and Client Earth, um, which you will have seen in the news, has had a lot of success uh, at holding the government to account, and the government is some um, uh, successive governments have been trying to duck and dive, uh, but they're definitely running out of room. Uh, we produced a whole stack of cartoons, um, uh, published some recently, about 15 recently, about um, Vladimir Putin. Um, so if I get pushed under a bus, please do a call for an inquest. Um, but uh, we had a lot of fun with Boris, um, uh, and this is an example of, of why it was so easy to um, campaign while he, he was mayor. Um, just in terms of jargon, uh, people do talk about nitrogen dioxide. Boris called it nitrous oxide, which is laughing gas, but it is actually nitrogen <laughs> dioxide. Uh, and also particles, but particles are regulated as a lump, all of them together, whereas nitrogen dioxide really is the only gas which is regulated for health and legal purposes, and it's very easy to measure. The health effects um, uh, are short-term and long-term, uh, and I think this slide's very important, the historical perspective. Because in 1952, we had the Great Smog, and people were really only worried about uh, respiratory effects from short-term exposure to visible air pollution. And we dealt with that with the Clean Air Act of 1956, which it's about time, of course, that was updated, as you may see sometimes in the press. Uh, but that um, uh, was dealt with by banning coal and wood burning in London and many other cities and towns around the UK and then around the world. Uh, but people thought that that problem had been cracked, but it was only in the mid-1990s, some big studies in the States, which followed cohorts of people, so a group like ourselves over 10 years or 20 years, and found that those people in the more polluted cities were dying a lot earlier. Uh, so you hear this number, um, uh, which is 29,000 deaths from air pollution in the UK. That is a correct number, statistical number. Uh, it is 11 and a half years each on average for that 29,000, so it's not just a few days at the end of the line. It's a correct statistical number for comparing with smoking at about 70 or 80,000, alcoholism at about 20,000, obesity at about 10,000. Uh, the real impact, because most of the uh, effect now is cardiovascular, so heart attacks and strokes is the long-term effect uh, from invisible air pollution and long-term exposure. Most effect is cardiovascular, uh, and so probably in practice, because we don't just die of one um, uh, public health thing like air pollution, we die of several things. Probably everyone who has a heart attack or stroke loses an additional two years of life because of air pollution levels in the UK. And it is important to realize that for the young who are affected, those in schools, and hopefully will benefit from this new standard BB101, which is being talked about, uh, that if their lungs are affected, they will not get that lung capacity back later on. So it really is important uh, to realize that air pollution affects everyone. Uh, we've talked about that. Um, uh, this was um, uh, just before the Olympics. Uh, you can see we had a bit of a, a problem. Um, and Boris's solution was something called the, the um, pollution suppressor truck, 
and he was spraying calcium magnesium acetate by the monitors that were most likely to report a legal breach or warn of a smog episode. And they were spraying this stuff in front of the monitor along the Olympic route network in Upper Thames Street three times a day, and it reduced PM levels by about 40%. So it did work uh, just in front of that 10 meter stretch in front of the monitor. Um, but you can see that it didn't have much effect because uh, that's what it was like the following year. Uh, the lessons, um, I think it is important to think of air pollution as one thing, uh, not as um, just carbon dioxide or just nitrogen dioxide. We do need to protect people during episodes and also day in, day out uh, air pollution. Uh, we need to address the problem at its source. Uh, I'm not a believer in offsetting solutions, so um, uh, ideas of um, uh, um, you know, uh, planting trees or something may work as a barrier, but I'm not a believer in just saying you can keep polluting more and more and we'll just plant more and more trees. I think you do need to tackle the problem at its source. And of course, indoor air quality, as I've mentioned, I think is the, 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 the most important single thing we can do and quickest to actually um, protect people. That's uh, a pretty good picture of what air pollution is like in London. That's nitrogen dioxide, but for the very fine particles, PM1, I suspect the picture would be pretty similar to that. Uh, and you can see Heathrow is um, sitting at the, uh, the left um, uh, over there. Uh, but anything, this is the um, WHO guideline and legal limit. Uh, you can see the extent of the problem in London. King's College says that many roads in central London will tend to have the highest levels of nitrogen dioxide in the whole world. So whereas we do worry about um, uh, the particle problems in China and India, where they're probably about seven times higher than, say, London, but for nitrogen dioxide, because of all of our diesel vehicles, our narrow roads um, and tall buildings, um, nitrogen dioxide is probably highest in the world. Certainly the King's College guys have not found any monitor, official monitor anywhere in the world reporting consistently higher levels. Uh, and there you can see the extent of the legal breaches. Um, uh, when I was very rude about the Labour government in 2009, the following year the Tories um, uh, started publishing this, which is the proportion of deaths uh, in every local authority in the country um, uh, attributable to the finer particles. Um, that, uh, I won't dwell on that, just the, um, uh, the important point, I've explained that it was sort of short-term respiratory effects that people worried about um, and from visible air pollution. But it is important to realise when people say, well look, you know, well, there's not much awareness about the dangers of air pollution. It's important to realise how far we've come, um, because actually smoking, it was only in the 1980s that that was declared carcinogenic by the World Health Organisation. And it was only uh, June 2012 when diesel exhaust was classified as carcinogenic and 2013 before outdoor air pollution was. So if you think how long it took us to ban smoking inside buildings um, uh, after smoking was identified for a risk, you can see that actually we're, it's not, not that long ago and therefore I think we should just be more optimistic about the, the pace of progress we're making. Uh, the legal aspect, uh, I think it is important. You might have seen Client Earth has had some wins. The government was forced to publish its nitrogen dioxide plan um, a couple of weeks ago during the general election period, which they didn't like. Uh, and we know why they didn't like doing it, because it showed the problems were bigger and their proposals were weaker um, than anyone expected. Uh, so I suspect that will go back to court. Um, there's also a threat of infraction action. We're at stage two of five stages on infraction action for nitrogen dioxide from the European Commission uh, with four other countries and I think that is something that will kick off and there's certainly a question what will happen after Brexit in terms of who will take over that policeman role. Um, so Client Earth has had uh, several wins and I expect they'll be back in court again um, later this year. Uh, the solutions um, this just gives a sense of if we can get rid of exhaust emissions um, uh, with electric vehicles, it would make a big difference to something like nitrogen dioxide, but tire and brake wear is certainly another problem. Uh, so it is about fewer and cleaner vehicles. Um, uh, we need to think also about buildings. Um, uh, I chair the Knightsbridge Neighbourhood Forum, which I've mentioned. We've produced the first uh, neighbourhood plan uh, 
gone through the first statutory consultation. And when I, um, uh, and just to explain these neighborhood forums, uh, their planning policies will carry the same weight or greater weight than the local authorities' planning policies when they've passed a referendum. So our policies will have as much weight as Westminster's, uh, and our patch includes the Hyde Park Barracks and, and Imperial and places like that. But when we sat down and I looked at the um, air policies, and you really look at what it means about reducing carbon and things like that for buildings, and you think about the air pollution problem, you actually say, we have to have zero air emissions from buildings. And what was surprising is that Chelsfield, a very well-known developer, uh, looking to, or well, they are in the process of developing the block between Harrods and the top of Sloan Street, they wanted to do an all-electric building. And the only reason they put in a planning application for two gas boilers and two CHP plants was for sustainability points. Now, to me, that is completely daft because that is by the road link, which DEFRA says will have the second highest levels of NO2 in the whole country in 2020. So they've certainly got an NO2 problem, and that's where I think some of uh, uh, Chris's filters will be needed. So we do need, I think, zero air emissions from buildings for all developments, but also major refurbishments. Um, uh, we need, I think, to look at this as an opportunity, so a lot of change is needed. We need to um, get through the whole building stock and reduce air of carbon emissions from the building stock by the mid-2030s, let's say. Um, but I think we should see this as the opportunity that we had 60 years ago with the first Clean Air Act, when we really transformed our city. Uh, I think we should encourage the good things, so walking, cycling, public transport, and so on and we should be discouraging the bad things, so we want to have quieter vehicles as well as less polluting vehicles and things. Uh, this is um, uh, the ultra low emission zone you might have heard of, um, and that's um, uh, 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 really um, just, Sadiq is proposed to bring forward that nicer bit uh, by a year or two, um, but it needs to be much bigger when you look back at that previous picture. Uh, I'll let Chris talk about 16890 in a moment, um, uh, but I think the next steps, um, certainly for what I'm doing, is um, doing what I can on uh, outdoor air and also encouraging people to take action on indoor air quality. So thank you very much, and um, I'll be pleased to take questions after Chris has spoken. Thank you. issues here in London, which he delivered in a very good, well-compressed time frame. Thanks very much. Uh, my name is Chris E. Cobb. I'm Global Technical Director of Canfill, and I'm going to talk to you today about a, a new standard for air filtration, ISO 16890. We are much more concerned with indoor air quality, but of course, outdoor air quality has some impact on what happens inside a building. So just to do some definitions, first of all, PM means uh, particulate matter, and when you hear PM on its own, it means all suspended particles in the air. And then within that, as you saw within Simon's presentation, we talk about certain size fractions, typically PM10, PM2.5, and PM1, which are all particles less than 10 microns, 2.5 and 1 micron, respectively. And just for those of you who are not to speed on this, a micron is one thousandth of a millimetre, so completely invisible to the naked eye. We talked a lot about pollutants in the previous presentation. This table or this slide gives an overview um, of where pollutants come from. We can think about particulate air pollutants, and we can also think about molecular or gaseous. We're not going to talk about those today. But for particulate, to sources, we have both man-made sources of pollution and we have natural sources. And as you run along the bottom row of that, present, that slide, you see that, for example, diesel engines, combustion processes, construction are the man-made sources. And natural sources include pollen, wind blown soil and sand, and volcanic ash, for example. One thing we can see is that, on average, man-made 
pollution in the air, particulate pollution, is much, much smaller in size than naturally occurring pollution. And equally, we also see that man-made pollution is produced much closer to centres of high population density, i.e. cities, than natural pollutants are. So they have an important bearing. Here's some other facts which are quite interesting just to set the scene. We typically, you know, in the developed countries, we eat one kilogram of food a day, we maybe drink two kilograms of fluid, but we actually drink 15 kilograms, sorry, we actually breathe 15 kilograms of air, even a fair, in a fairly sedentary lifestyle. We take care of the food we eat, organic food, we take care of the water we drink, but who really takes care of all the air that we breathe? A few years ago, the European Commission warned us that indoor air quality may be 50 times worse than the outdoor air. And that's through the action of ventilation systems, concentration, pollutants inside buildings and adding to them the internal source pollutants, things which outgas from building structure. It's also a fact that now we spend up to 90% of our time inside buildings, so indoor air quality has the possibility to have a big impact on human health. And finally, we saw a couple of occasions in Simon's presentation, people like the World Health Organization talk about PM10, very large coarse fraction of particles, PM2.5, but actually the medical evidence now is very much that it's the particles significantly smaller than one micron in size that have the greatest ability to have a negative impact on human health. And the reason is very clear. The human body has some natural defenses, nasal hairs and mucous membranes which will trap larger particles as you breathe them in. The smaller the particle, they're able to penetrate really deep down into the fine structure of the lungs, and the smallest particles, in fact, will pass from the lungs into the bloodstream, circulate around the entire body, and reach all the critical organs. And there was really a groundbreaking study published by English researchers last year at Manchester, Oxford, and Lancaster University. They have found in the human brain particles significantly smaller than one micron made of metal, which they have identified as coming from diesel engines. So those particles have gone directly to the brain and they are now linking them to early onset dementia. Okay, that said as an introduction, let me now introduce this new global standard for the testing and classification of air filters, because air filters really are the key barrier between outdoor air and indoor air quality in a modern building. So historically or traditionally, there's a number of air filter testing standards. In America, ASHRAE 52.2 is dominant. Within Europe in the last years, EN779 has been dominant. In Asia, we see a mixture of both of those standards and some local standards, for example, Japanese standards or Korean standards or Chinese standards. So 16890 really does, as an ISO standard, represent a very significant harmonization for the air filtration industry. And we might as well just think here now, how often is it that we get involved in projects where the engineer is in one country, the contractor or the builder is in the second country, and the job site is in a third country? So doesn't it make sense to have harmonization on air filter testing and classification? Let's just look at the benefits of this new customer, uh, this customer benefits of this new standard. First of all, recognition, it's written in the standard that air filters will improve indoor air quality and they will benefit human health. It's more intuitive. Um, filter efficiency and the classification system relate to real world air pollution. To how many people in this room could honestly say that an F7 filter means something or a MERV 14 filter really means something about how a human's going to benefit from working behind or underneath such a filter. And finally, global applicability, so it's eliminating confusion. There are also benefits for the filtration industry as well. At the global level, it's going to very much create a level playing field. And in my personal opinion, in my role, I think this is going to drive a lot of product innovation and customer value. But at the same time, a lot of the low-performing products 
will get squeezed or pushed out of the marketplace. Also means that every filter company really now only needs one test rig to play at the high professional level. That isn't the case today, you need several. So this is reducing a, a barrier to entry, which really is a good thing. And finally, simplicity. For sales team and marketers, it's much easier to explain uh, filter performance and function in terms of uh, its, its application. So let me just give you some headline points about ISO 16890. First of all, filter performance is now measured and recorded against three particle size fractions, PM10, PM2.5, and extremely importantly, PM1. And once you've got those measurements, you can report a filter into one of four classifications, E meaning efficiency, so there are EPM1 rated filters, EPM 2.5, EPM 10, and then for really low performing filters there is a, a coarse filter category. There's also, um, for those of you who know anything about air filter testing, there's a methodology for loading up a filter with artificial dust in the laboratory so you can see how the pressure drop curve develops, and that's something of a me measure of energy consumption and lifetime. And in the new ISO standard, that test dust is now much more aligned with the particle size you would see suspended in the atmosphere outside in big cities. The other important feature of this standard, it includes as a mandatory requirement for EPM1 filters and EPM2.5, you must subject the filter to a discharge procedure, which will remove any temporary electrostatic charge on the filter which would serve to drive up its efficiency when that filter is new. Because it's well known, and this graph shows it, when you put such a filter into use over a matter of weeks or maybe a short number of months, that electrostatic charge will dissipate in use because of the pollutants in the air. And as this chart shows you, the right-hand column, the efficiency after some weeks or months can be significantly lower than when that filter was installed as new. And the ISO standard, has a step in it to simulate that step, to avoid that, really um, pulling the wool over customers' eyes, quite frankly. And importantly as well, if you want to qualify for EPM1 and EPM2.5 categories, the most efficient filters, then you must achieve a minimum 50% efficiency when the filter was new and after the filter's been subjected to the discharge. And I think that's really quite meaningful. Today you can go out and buy filters which have 10, 20, 30, 40% efficiency. You know, what's the point? Let's at least have a meaningful value on a filter that really is going to deliver some benefit and improvement in indoor air quality. In terms of timeline, the ISO standard was published the 1st of December 2016. Already, that standard is now adopted in the UK and in Holland, rather surprisingly, as the EN and the Dutch European standards, so it's live in this country now. The reason Holland was uh, involved so quickly, there's no translation issue standards in Holland are published in England. EN 779, the dominant standard, will be discontinued the end of June 2018. It will no longer exist. It would be pointless to specify it, it would be pointless to buy filters or install filters rated according to that standard. In America, the position is a little bit less certain, they're much more resistant to change over there, <laughs> but I think in due course, hopefully ASHRAE will um, embrace the new ISO standard, but it might take three, five years, who knows. So how does the standard work? Well, the standard is quite complex, it's written in four parts, but in practicality when we're testing, first of all you measure this so-called fractional efficiency of the filter in the laboratory, you measure its efficiency against PM1 particles, PM2.5 and PM10. You then apply this discharge procedure to get rid of any electrostatic charge and if it's a PM1 or PM2.5 filter, you then retest the filter to, to check the fractional efficiency after the electrostatic charge has gone. 
If you then want to do the dust loading to look at pressure drop, pro pressure drop development, you do it at this stage, but it's optional, not compulsory. And then you use the classification system to assign a, a rating for that filter. This slide is going to show you how this standard can really now deliver some value in terms of indoor air quality and human health. If we imagine a kind of arbitrary time scale and filter performance or indoor air quality measurement, and we go back to 2002 when the original ISO standard was introduced, that set at the time a benchmark for filter performance and indoor air quality. That standard was revised in 2012. Um, just for those of you who don't know, uh, the EN standard requires you to test at 0.4 micron size particles. And you, when that standard was upgraded in 2012, it became mandatory to do this electrical discharge test to remove that using exposure to IPA, isopropyl alcohol. And if you wanted to qualify for this so-called magical F7 filtration, which is pretty typical for final filtration in buildings, then um, you had to achieve a minimum of 35% efficiency. With the introduction of the new ISO standard, we see some changes now. For an ISO, an EP and one rated filters, we're testing between 0.3 and 1 micron size particles. We have to achieve 50% minimum efficiency, as I said, to qualify. And we know from our measurements in the laboratory, that filter will actually deliver a minimum of 40% efficiency against 0.4 micron size particles. So if you choose EPM1 rated filters, you are delivering better air quality and improved human health or protection of human health compared to a current EN779 F7. By contrast, if you select an EPM 2.5 rated filter, here you're measuring filter efficiency between 0.3 and 2.5 microns, so a larger particle size range. Again, you must achieve 50%, so that's all well and good against larger particles. But the reality is, if you challenge that filter with 0.4 micron particles, as the old EN779 test, then you're going to have an efficiency at best of 30%, which is clearly a backward step compared to EN779, whereas a minimum you would have 35%. So, consequences of this new standard for indoor air quality. Um, compared to the dominant standards today, now specifiers, purchasers, users of air filters have the chance to select filters which are rated according to real world particle sizes. As I said before, that isn't the case for an F7 filter or an N6 or a MERV 13 in America. Meaningless by comparison. You can also, if you choose, select PM1 rated filters, EPM1 filters. They are going to give you the maximum protection against what the scientific and the medical communities now realize are the most dangerous particles. The ultrafine particles, which are a subset within PM1. All filters rated in PM1 will be effectively discharged. There will be no temporary enhancement of filter performance by a temporary electrostatic charge. And as I just said, an EPM1 50% rated filter will definitely deliver you better air quality than an EN779 F7 filter from 2012. And an EPM 2.5 rated filter at 50% will deliver you for certain poorer air quality than that same F7 filter. We also know there's a link between indoor air quality and human cognitive performance. And these studies which are made both in the laboratory, in real world situations such as offices, schools and call centres, we know there's a link between CO2 levels, ventilation rates, and the presence of VOCs and nitrogen dioxide inside buildings. And in fact, now, even after EPM, after ISO uh, 16890, you can buy combination filters as you can. The particulate performance will be rated EPM1, 
and the molecular filtration performance to remove the gases will be rated against the corresponding standard ISO 10121. And then final slide, this isn't the end of the story, this is very much just the beginning of the story. Two of the major landmark things to at least introduce you to that's going to be happening before the end of June 2018. Many of you will know that there's a system within your road vent today so that the energy efficiency or the energy consumption demanded by an air filter is rated on the basis of its performance in its kilowatt demand. Your events are now starting the ball rolling to introduce a new system where that energy rating will be assessed on the basis of ISO 16890 rather than EN 779. And also the interesting point that uh, Simon hinted at in his opening, some of you may be aware of EN standard 13779. This also is about ventilation systems within inside buildings and the internal environment. And within this standard, it actually made recommendations for what styles of filters or what efficiency of filters should be deployed in a ventilation system if you wanted to go from a certain category of outdoor air to a certain category of indoor air. So you could have outdoor categorized as being in central London, in a much smaller town or maybe out in the countryside. And then there were three or four levels of increasing indoor air quality. And that standard told you what filter, well it recommended what filter combinations you should use to go from one outdoor air quality to an indoor air quality. Well of course EN 13779 will get withdrawn if it's not already because EN 779 will be withdrawn in the middle of next year. But we do know, as of last week, it's going to be replaced by BS EN 16798 um, Part 3, which is energy performance of buildings. And that, that standard will now not just advise, it will require as mandatory for new buildings. If you want to go from a certain outdoor air quality to a new indoor air quality, then it's going to tell you what filters to use and how they should be rated according to the ISO 16890 and the ISO 10121 for molecular filters. So that was a brief introduction to this new standard. It's very much the start of the road. The standard is live in the UK now, it can be used. The filters are being rated to it. Can fill will be dual labeling filters on the filters themselves and on packaging literally in the coming weeks, certainly by the end of May. And over the next 18 months, you're gonna see a big transformation in this industry, particularly as your event kicks in and the new uh, ENBS 16798 comes in. So I hope you found that enlightening, a quick overview, networking opportunity now, and uh, I'll be happy to try and answer any questions. Thank you. Questions, clarification, point there for lack of a Existing for some years now, 
ISO 10121. And this is the standard for testing of, uh, it's not my language, it's the American language, gas phase filters for um, ventilation systems. And that test standard allows you to test both the absorbent particles and more importantly, a full sized finished filter. And we have test rigs to do that test. There's very few of them elsewhere. Um, but, it, I'll stress this now, it's not a classification system. It's a testing method. But we do know that the working committee within ISO, as we're sitting on this committee, their vision is down the road there will be a classification system. But it, don't uh, hold your breath, because ISO works slowly and it will take some years. But that's in the pipeline. Thanks for the questions. Sure. What if you replace the EN779 is based on 0.4 microns, normal respirable fraction is 0.5 to 0.7? Isn't that sort of going back to one micron? Isn't that going backwards? Well, it, it's EPM1. Remember, PM1 is the fraction of everything smaller than one micron. Right. Everything, right down to the limits of measurement. Yeah. Which is 0 0.005 microns, maybe. I mean, we define ultrafine particles as 0.01 microns, and actually it's the ultrafine particles for diesel emissions, which are the serious problem. But you don't see it, do you just see that the new standard is giving you a higher percentage efficiency than the old EN779? Well, it's a complete, you can't, uh, we've asked this question a lot. If I have an F7 filter previously, what should I replace it with? The test methods are so different. I think the real fundamental value is a customer can actually understand what he's getting at. But you need to get the um, PM1 standard to be sure you're going to be better yes. than 779, yes. otherwise you'll be worse. Yeah, as you say, it's all right in three standards, you know, 2.5 to 10, but basically it's quite much. Yeah. That is for indoor air quality and human health protection. Yeah. But as the people on the ISO committee pointed out, there are other applications for air filters where you don't need that level of manufacturing. Yeah. So that, that's the point. And often you multi-stage filters, so there's a logic to it. Thank you very much. Great presentations. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the areas we saw real challenges were, were NOx levels there. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I was looking last week when it was, it was hitting the news, so I thought I'd better find out about some of this technology. And um, certainly the, the NOx filters that I saw online were something, you know, 50 kilos of filter or something to take out NOx. Is that, is that what's needed or are, are, we, are, are there new technologies that are being developed that we, we're going to see something that people can readily incorporate into their systems? I think what you're referring to, 50 kilograms, I would, 40 to 50 kilograms, I would have said is the traditional solution. People think about a carbon filter in an airport, for example, but there have been more contemporary solutions available now for at least 10, maybe 12 years, where the, the form of the absorbent is completely different, the filter is totally different, it weighs 12 kilograms rather than a whole metal assembly of 75 kilograms, and this is very much the area that we are promoting at the moment. So, yes. They do exist. In terms of operational uh, cost, uh, are, are these filters, uh, the gas, gas filters, are these something that would need uh, high operational input to make sure that they maintain their efficacy? So are they needing changing very regularly or do they, in, in a climate like central London, you know, great for filter manufacturers, but not so good for the operators, or, or are there solutions which are gonna have some longevity? I think the first case, the 50 kilogram solution, if I can call it that, you should be looking at two years' lifetime. And I'll take these more contemporary ones, six months at once. I think it's, um, uh, it's also worth emphasizing uh, that we need to distinguish between um, NOx, oxides of nitrogen, and NO2, nitrogen dioxide. So NOx is NO2 and NO. Um, 
not, and uh, what happens is that um, a lot of the transport um, industries refer to NOx because it's the emissions that come out of tailpipes or exhaust. Um, but NO2 is the sort of gas concentration uh, which is regulated for health and legal purposes. So um, focus on nitrogen dioxide. Uh, when I speak to journalists and things like that, I say, you know, the um, schoolboy error that people make, everyone makes, I've made it plenty of times, uh, people have referred to you know, nitrous oxide or NOx, whereas it's actually nitrogen dioxide, which is the health uh, issue that we want to focus on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, another question here, Martin. Just a quick one, because I believe that you know, it is inherent that we should provide everybody with clean air, healthy air. My question is, what, or if any, financial penalty is there for the, the customer to choose a lower graded filter Really, Chris. <laughs> I think I would, the reference I would look at on that which I find most interesting, uh, a fact I found from the Well Building Institute recently, and they were saying in a typical city centre building over a 30 year lifetime, I don't remember the exact numbers, but certainly more than 90% of those total costs were human costs salaries, insurance, yep. absenteeism of people in the building, the construction costs, design costs, and maintenance together, they segregated them, but they were maximum 10% of that 30 years. So it seems very obvious that you should be doing everything possible to protect the human capital within the building. That's how those people should receive. They're the money-making assets within the building. I totally agree, but we as a, certainly as a country, until we are punitively find or have a uh, legislation in place, we will take the cheap option. And we've all recognised well-being of people and buildings is, is the inherent of us, of us. What I would say is that there's a change coming about where individuals can now easily access their personal air quality sensors on their phone. And that's going to drive potentially health and safety issues and claims against an organisation. My point being is that I think it needs something from a financial or health and safety point of view, standpoint, to make that change happen. If you give the people the option, they will go to the cheap solution. Yeah, I think it's um, uh, in the building regulations, I think there's a standard for nitrogen dioxide um, to be reduced uh, below the WHO guideline. And, and I think you're right that you know, that cartoon I showed about the World Health Organization classifying smoking as carcinogenic or air pollution, you know, really only 2013 for outdoor air pollution. Uh, you know, people are much more aware of these risks now. And I think um, people will be saying to their employers, did I have a heart attack because particle levels in this building are an awful lot higher than they are in the street or something, or, or a lot lower. Um, I think it's also worth saying um, uh, with air filters that a lot of the cost is actually the energy cost for pushing the air through the air filters. Um, and uh, so having low energy air filters, which um, uh, um, you know, reduce that pressure drop, um, can reduce the um, total costs very substantially. So. Uh, I think it's air filters may only be maybe 10% of, um, of, of that cost of um, cleaning up air coming to a building. standard. I mean, I um, asked the Environmental Audit Committee, one of the things I asked them to do was to set a, an air filter standard for um, schools, and so the Environmental Audit Committee included that in one of their recommendations in 2014. There's this BB101 standard which has been coming through, which is a guideline, um, but I gather the Department of Education has been a bit slow at um, uh, signing it off. <laughs> Sorry? I think that's why 39. 
Revision 39. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think um, uh, these are the sort of things where we just have to keep the pressure up, and it's one of my jobs as a campaigner to highlight the slowness of um, some of these government departments. Okay, one more at the back. Specifically, well, the new standard better, or better, better standards, better air quality, better fuel storage because they're driving the cost down. That, that says they don't need to drive costs down. And yet, they're not going to be in the city of Denver, as many of them drive here. We're driving the cost down, it's a race to the bottom. Yeah. So, how are we educating? see what other people in the room say, but uh, I think it has to be in part at events like this, so speaking to people who are professionals in the industry, so that's part of it. But I think also um, uh, you know, getting, uh, you know, my job sort of try and get, you know, we have had some articles in the press and things, uh, but also to get people working in the buildings to be saying, well, you know, I, I often tweet um, to 36,000 followers saying, you know, ask your facilities managers um, whether the building complies with, um, um, you know, EN 13779, so I'm not going to have to have a new hashtag, but, uh, uh, but, you know, I think that's part of it, getting people to ask the, because if they ask inside and people say, well, well I don't know, or no, it doesn't, um, they're going to get some people complaining, and the cost, don't forget, of these filters really is quite small compared to the other costs, as Chris mentioned, of, um, uh, you know, paying salaries and things for people, so you really want highly motivated, happy people, so. I don't disagree with you. Yeah. It's, it's, it's how we educate people in the building of human, uh, and that's, for me, the key because we talked a lot about some good stuff here, and I completely agree with what you're saying, it's how we educate. Yeah, I think there's, so, uh, sorry, yeah. 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 speak yeah. up, yeah. Yeah, sorry, can, you, yeah. can you speak up so we can all hear? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, 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 we're actually working I think it's also worth saying, you know, the London plan, because I campaigned on the London plan when that was, you know, brought in up to 2011, 2012, uh, and that actually had specific things in it about saying you shouldn't dump vulnerable people in polluted places or more pollution on vulnerable people. Um, the Knightsbridge neighbourhood plan um, uh, that we have got just about ready to lodge formally with Westminster to go through the planning examination process specifically says, as a planning policy, uh, that buildings over a certain size should comply with IS 16, ISO 16890. And, and the, one of the reasons I was asking Chris about the, uh, the other ISO standards coming is so that we can make sure that we put those in um, uh, this planning policy, which will carry full weight. So if they redevelop the Hyde Park Barracks, this policy will apply there. And I think a lot of other neighborhood forums, and I hope the mayor will adopt policies as well. That might help put in the planning system. That's a jolly good way to get things done. Any more to finish up? Yeah, yeah. Um, I went to CPD about three weeks ago.
It also describes the energy costs and rental costs, and they're much smaller pieces of the pie, where very often building services engineers' efforts are based, and that's why they go, well, that's a very small part of it, I'm not seeing the benefits of it. So usually it has one picture to say, well, look, this is, this is the benefit you can get, you can make a benefit on this massive part of the operating costs. Maybe that can be what changes their mind. It certainly had a very large impact on me. Can you um, do a screenshot of that and tweet it? with hashtag um, 16890 or something yeah, like see that. See interaction. Yeah. Last yeah. question here, and I think we're gagging for a drink, some of us. engaging questions which I'm sure are going to continue over drinks. So was there one more question at the doctor? Just a quick one. Alright, I'm um, just picking up on some of the other things that Paul talked about. I think what I worked with at the company was only Silver. And one of the things that would really help me convince people that we need to start doing this is if we could have in office sensors that were cheap and small and reliable that were reporting that air quality. Because there's one thing to say One quick response to the uh, lady on the balcony. Um, first of all, sensors is something of a holy grail today, the combination of accuracy, reproducibility, uh, a wide spectrum of what can be measured, and of course, the economics, and there are a lot of people are working on that. 
We see lots of product releases, we test very many of them in our laboratories. We don't see anything yet which is really, we feel, meets anything like the performance that the instruments that professional hygienists would use. And secondly, as a uh, representative of the filtration industry, I have to say one more thing. A sensor in a room only actually tells half the story. If the, if the room is empty, all well and good, but the minute you bring human activity into that room, particle levels in particular change dramatically. So what I would say is that it's what the individual is recording that's going to go to waste. Yes. Yeah. Irrelevant of what you're saying, and I agree with what you're saying. If I'm wearing a sensor and I'm in a not so good area, that's what's going to count. Okay, yeah. so there's going to be some discussions over drinks, obviously, but join me in thanking you, Sue, for a fantastic. Thank you.